Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to episode 67 of the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this is another super special episode just for you. A few weeks ago, you heard in one of our Doctors in episodes some of my favorite clips from Teacher PD Weekend 2021. And today, you get to hear the entire conversation with Dr. Marshawn Hyman, who gave us the most amazing presentation on the art of facilitation, navigating conversations across across race and culture in the music classroom. Get ready. Dr. Hyman is about to explain how to be the best facilitator for your students. I sincerely can't wait to hear what you think about this one. Don't forget, if you want to catch all the presentations from Teacher PD Weekend 2021, or be in the know for everything happening for PD Week 2022, or just be a part of the conversation, you can totally join us over at Patreon. Music Ed Matters, Patreon page is where you support the show. Speaking of supporters, this episode is brought to you by our friends over at the Kennison Choral Company. Make sure you have checked out their amazing tracks over at kcc.com. You can find a direct link to their resources at emilybirch.org slash sponsors and click on the KCC logo. They are so helpful right now as we are gearing up for our choir season. Without further ado, I cannot wait to give you this replay from Teacher PD Week 2021, Dr. Marsha and Hyman and the Art of Facilitation. All right, we are starting session number three, welcoming Dr. Marsha and Hyman. It's great to see you, Dr. Hyman. Hey, good to see you, everyone. <laughs> I'm so excited that you can be here sharing um, the Art of Facilitation, thanks to your amazing work with True Change Alliance. We have a few people live in Savannah. We have some people tuning in across the country, and it is all yours, my friend. I love it. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Good to see you all. My name is Dr. Marshawn Hyman. I am a former high school choir teacher, top middle school and children's choir as well, and have now kind of entered into the diversity space. And I'm exploring this intersection of music and diversity and how we might support educators in advancing their practices in the classroom. So the session today is called The Art of Facilitation, uh, Navigating Conversations Across Race and Culture in the Music Classroom. So this session might feel a little bit different. It's not going to be heavily music focused. I'm going to ideally give you a new skill that can then integrate into music as you go back into your classrooms over the next year. Um, I am one of three founders of a consultant consultant firm where we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion practices within organizations and it's schools, private companies, nonprofits, etc. So um, that's the lens that I'm bringing to this session today. Two of my colleagues here is Justin and Jory. Um, they're not with me today, of course, but we work uh, closely together to support companies in their diversity work. Um, our mission is to kind of help enable leaders, right? So as you think about um, leadership, it's not the position that you have, right? But the way you enter the room. So we help people understand that wherever you are within the organization, you are a leader and you are someone that's responsible for working with a diverse group of people. So we want to help you show up well in that space. Okay, so I agenda today, we're going to talk about effective facilitation. So I'll give you some strategies on how to be a good facilitator. We'll then connect that to the music classroom. And then we'll end today with some powerful questions. And I do have a document for you to take away with a huge list of questions that may or may not apply directly to your teaching, but there are questions that will can help drive conversation when you are facilitating these types of conversations. And then three desired outcomes connected to our agenda. First, I hope that you leave or being able to articulate some key concepts of effective facilitation. I hope that you leave being able to identify some musical elements in your classroom that you can connect to race and culture and have those conversations with students. And then lastly, be able to employ some powerful questions when you are working with your ensembles. Okay, so we'll start first by quickly talking about the difference between teaching and facilitation. Many of us go to college, we learn how to teach, we learn music, we go and start teaching and that's what we do, right? The basic premise of teaching is generally there's a a unidirectional relationship, right? There's someone in the room that has content expertise delivering information to someone else who is there to learn and understand this particular 
concept, right? Um, so there's one party that is in need of knowledge. Now, generally, we ideally, if we're good teachers, we're learning as well with our students, but generally teaching, I have content expertise, I'm delivering that content to you. Facilitation differs in the way that it is multi-directional, right? And that the content that we are learning happens with the educator and with the students, with all parties, regardless of their role in the room. And then there's this underlying idea that the knowledge is already present in the room and that as a facilitator, it's our job to simply hold space and kind of create a process that brings out the learning. Right. So teaching is I got the information. I'm giving it to you. Facilitating is the, the knowledge is already here. I'm just going to create a space to kind of help us understand what the knowledge is and how we can learn from that knowledge. And that's kind of that's the skill set that I love to give for you, give to you today. So um, our facilitation framework at TCA are, is three steps, um, prevention, intervention and then processing. Right. And I'm going to go through all of these, give you a couple of examples, and we'll do a little bit of practice together as well. So when I say prevention, um, a prevention um, is there are actions taken before the lesson or discussion to ensure, ensure a smooth process. Now, I know as an educator, you probably do this already, right? But you kind of think about before the students come into the classroom, where do the chairs need to be? What music are we doing? What are the rules? What are the norms? What are the processes, right? So this won't differ that much. But a couple of things you need to discuss is the topic. So what are we going to be talking about? When you're having conversations that are sensitive as race and culture, you need to kind of guide students toward this is what we're talking about today. Um, we'll be talking about um, Mandarin and Asian culture, right? And I have an example for you later. Um, we're going to be talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. We're going to be talking about whatever it might be. Give them the topic. There should be an agenda kind of to understand how we're going to move through that process, right? And that is important because a lot of times, uh, folks have their own idea of what they would like to talk about or their own idea of how we like to get there, but setting the agenda ensures that we are moving toward the same way. Desired outcomes, as I talked about at the beginning of this session, where do we want to go? That helps root us in the conversation. And if people get off topic, you can bring them back to the desired outcomes, right? So that helps root us into our result. And then the, this last one is the most important, norms. It's so important to talk about norms and the behaviors that we expect of each other when we're entering conversations. These might be rules in our classroom or kind of expectations in our classroom. When we talk about facilitation, the, the term is norms, right? So it's one person, one person speaking at a time. It might be both and thinking. That's one of my favorite norms when I talk about race, meaning that there are many things that can be true at the same exact time. And it's important that we hold space for those multiple truths, right? So whatever it might be for you, it's important that you set norms and you talk about that before you begin your lesson or your conversation. So those are a couple topics for preventing anything from happening that you do not want to happen. Second is the intervention, right? So we do our best as educators and facilitators to create a space, to set up norms and the, the physical space is there. We're on the same page. We understand where we're going. Hopefully things go as well as we hope. And sometimes they don't, right? So it's also important that we know how to intervene when things are not moving in the direction that we'd like. So the simple definition is actions taken during the lesson or discussion to help us get back on track. All right, there are a couple techniques that I'll give you for interventions. One is a process suggestion. Um, a lot of times as teachers will say, hey, that's not where we're going. We're going to get back on track. Let's go. Right? And also, depending on how much time we have, we simply will redirect and keep it moving. Right? When we think about the facilitation space, it's important that we understand that there's expertise there right? that we're all learning. So it's important that we suggest a process. So for example, uh, someone makes a comment that's really off topic. It's not really where we want to go. Um, as a facilitator, you can say, hey, I'm noticing that we want to move in this direction. How does the group feel about that? Um, and let, let the group kind of chime in. Are we on the same page? Do we not want to move that direction? Do we want to go somewhere else? Right? We make a decision together. And then these two sub, uh, sub bullets here is that we gain agreement. Right? We're all on the same page, or at least the majority of us are on the same page. Great. We'll move in that direction. And you've got to enforce that. Right, so someone in five minutes comes in and has another off-topic comment. You can remember, hey, we just agreed a few minutes ago that we're going to move in this direction. I want to remind us. Right, so you make a suggestion, you gain an agreement, and then you enforce that throughout the session. And there are times where this might happen multiple times. Right, hey, I'm, I'm sensing we want to go in this other direction. How do we feel about that? 
right? Your job as the facilitator is to kind of keep us moving on the same page. A second technique is to ask or say what's being perceived, right? So sometimes when you're talking about sensitive topics, people might get nervous, might get quiet, um, folks might be stumbling over words. So as, a phys- as the facilitator, you can say, hey, it, it seems that people are getting a little nervous about this topic. Is that true? Right? And that is a good way to generate conversation. And someone say, actually, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable and this is why. And get folks to really be honest and authentic about what they're talking about. Right? Um, sometimes we're afraid to kind of name what we're saying, but as a facilitator, name it and let people respond to it. Now, this third one is one of my favorites. Um, it's called boomerang. <laughs> a boomerang can be used for two purposes. And when I say boomerang, that means to throw a question back to the group, right? Or so someone asks you a question, hey, um, what is this particular culture mean, et cetera? Um, if you don't know the answer, you can boomerang it back and say, oh, interesting question. What do y'all think? <laughs> right, so it's a great technique when you don't know the answer to just throw it back to the group. Um, boomeranging also helps engage the room. So even if you do know the answer and maybe there's only two or three people that are engaging with you, you can throw it back to the group, boomerang it, and hopefully someone else will chime in and kind of engage with you, All right? So again, boomerang is two reasons. If you don't know the answer, throw it back. Hopefully someone else in the room will know it or you want to engage conversation. And then lastly, as you kind of gain expertise in your ability to navigate different conversations, you can choose between these different, uh, these, these last four here, legitimize what someone just said. Oh, thank you, Billy. That was really, that was great. That's actually correct. Um, you can accept it without legitimizing or challenging. And you can say, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Kind of just allow it to sit in the room. Um, if you do know that something is incorrect or something that is offensive to another community, challenge it. Um, say, hey, actually, that could be offensive to X community, and this is why, right? And then you provide some, some explanation. Or defer. If you are uncomfortable with the statement, if you don't know the answer, um, you find a way to kind of, great, thanks so much. So anyone else want to share, <laughs> right? And you kind of just move forward and defer from that, All right? So those are techniques as a facilitator you can think about. Um, that's true. I'm going to legitimize that statement. I'm simply going to accept it. Uh, that's not true. And I'm comfortable enough challenging and explaining why I'm going to challenge it. Or I'm really uncomfortable. I don't know the answer. And we're going to, we're going to move forward, right? <laughs> and these are techniques also as a teacher that you can employ. Cool. So um, we talked about preventions and we talked about interventions. Now I'd love to just pause real quick and do um, a quick practice round. So I'm removing the practice round. Sorry to interrupt. I know you are enjoying this so much and I bet you're taking fabulous notes because Dr. Hyman is the best. But this practice round, Dr. Hyman gave us a situation. He gave us a scenario that we worked on as a team. And one of the people that was there went away, didn't hear our conversation and came back. And we that created the situation, acted as students, and the person who went away acted as the facilitator and put into practice some of the strategies we had learned. And then as a group with Dr. Hyman, we unpacked the entire scenario, screenplay, whatever you want to call it, situation on what worked, what didn't, what could we have done differently, what could we have done better. It was a really cool hands-on application of what we had learned so far in this presentation. If you want to see that, jump over to patreon.com slash musicedmatters and you can see the entire thing. But for this purpose, you as listeners, it didn't make sense to listen to that whole segment. So now you know what we did as our little practice and we can jump right back over into Dr. Hyman and more skills as we learn to be the best facilitators for our students and our singers. Okay, so and then the third uh, step is to process, right? So we've thought before our session or our lesson how we're going to set this pro- uh, session up. We're going to prevent some things from happening. We've talked about intervening. And now after you finish, whether it be a lesson, a unit, a performance, a trip, anything, it's so important that we pause and help students process. And that definition is supporting students in making sense of and or learning from their experience. Um, So often students process with each other and they kind of take things away, but it's so impactful for the educator or the facilitator to say, let's actually talk about it and apply that to our next steps and apply that to our lives and our journey. A couple of techniques, um, individual reflection. So having students just pause and journal or kind of think through what just happened. And then of course, sharing out. 
Um, small group talk is always good. We know students want to talk to each other. So finding ways to have them be productive in their conversation with each other is great. Uh, multimedia experiences. So listening to a recording or watching a quick video or um, a dance or something kind of allow them to see something or hear something and using that to kind of reflect on the experience. And then powerful questions. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in our third section. Uh, but powerful questions are a great way to really evoke conversation. Cool. Um, so quickly revisit. You want to prevent it. You want to intervene if necessary, then help students process through their experience at the end of that conversation, lesson, unit, whatever it is that you might be culminating um, in your classroom. Cool. So how does this connect to the music classroom? There are a couple elements that I love to kind of talk to you about. Um, first is thinking about composers. And ideally, this will connect to any uh, elementary, middle, high school, band, course, orchestra, whatever it might be, but thinking about the composers that you're bringing into the classroom. So what are the background and upbringing of those composers? Uh, what are those composer demographics? Are they a person of color? Are they a white person? Uh, where do they, where did they live? Where do they currently live? Um, are they uh, a part of the LGBTQ plus population? How might these pieces of information influence the way we teach the music? How might it influence the way we um, perform the music with our students, right? So talking about this as you introduce pieces of music to the, to the classroom is really important. And then similarly with poets, um, kind of how they come up, what's their background, what's the style of poetry, how does that text impact the music that the composer wrote, right, and having a conversation between the poet and the composer. I think generally, but also how does race then come into that? This is a Black poet. How might that influence the music? When did they write the music? Is it 2021? Was it in the, in the 50s or the 40s? And unfortunately, today, that might not be, <laughs> there might not be a difference in the, the experience of, of that particular poet. Um, but talking about that and how that influences your performance is, is really important. And then, of course, the genre or the style of music, right? So what's the origin of this genre? What does it come out of? What does it flow into? Um, specifically thinking about jazz or um, gospel or hip hop or kind of what are the different influences and how does that influence the way we talk about it and, and perform? And then I was thinking about this in the elementary classroom, but the origin of instruments, right? So as you introduce new instruments to your students, what cultures do they come out of? How are they made? How does that influence the way you think about the music and perform it? Is there dance that you can use to kind of to solidify or introduce a different culture to the classroom? Instructional strategies are important. So often we privilege the ability to read music, right? So we drill solfege, we drill all these different um, strategies to get ready for a music performance assessment. And not often do we privilege listening or singing by ear, right? Or improv um, or movement within our rehearsals. So when we begin to introduce a piece of music to our, our classroom, do we go directly to solfege and music reading? Do we pause and just listen? Do we do you have someone improv and kind of just throw something in there and see how they feel about the music? But what are we actually bringing in, and how do those how does that relate to different cultures, right? And then rehearsal planning. I was really bad with this. I would program my very serious pieces at the very beginning of rehearsal when students are fresh. Right? I wanted to make sure they were focused, they were ready to go, that they were thinking about um, music and, and they were ready to, to really engage with me. And then I put some of the fun pieces at the end, right? And I, I put fun in quotes, right? But what do we legitimize with our rehearsal planning, right? And what types of cultures do we legitimize when we kind of structure the, the rehearsal? Right? It's really important. And I was, even someone that cared about this work, I often still privileged traditional classical music over jazz and, and spirituals and things like that that we perceive to be more fun. Cool. And then performance design. So when you deliver your performances, and I, I wasn't paid to say this, but I think Emmy does as well, where she will kind of bring the choir into the audience, right? That we are interacting with our audience, right? <laughs> You're welcome. Um, are you talking about the composers and the poets when you introduce a piece of music to the audience? Are you kind of engaging them in the history of the music and kind of pushing them to think a little bit differently? Are you giving them things to listen for as you sing the piece and kind of follow up after you finish the song? What did you hear? What did you notice? How'd that make you feel, even with your audience? And the purpose of these pieces of music, right? Um, 
Ideally, your audiences leave transformed, thinking a little bit different, kind of shifting their perspective as opposed to simply being entertained, right? And really thinking about how you design your performances can really help create conversations about race and culture in the classroom as well as when those, those families leave and go home. And then community relations is something that's interesting, but really for us to think about when you bring in those, the accompanist or you bring in orchestra folks to play uh, for your concerts, what do they look like? <laughs> do they look like your, your choir, your band, your orchestra? Or are we bringing in people of different cultures and races to really give representation? I, I can't remember how often, even as someone who is well into their career, there's many times I say, oh man, I didn't realize I could do that thing. I didn't realize I could go to that school. I didn't realize X, Y, Z, because I just saw for the first time a Black person doing that thing. And it's so important that we bring people that look like our students. Also thinking about who you request feedback from when you are bringing in uh, adjudicators and you're bringing in professors and other music teachers to give feedback. We hear, different, we hear things differently. It's important for students to see them and as well as you for, for you to get those different perspectives. And then often we will perform at churches or cathedrals for the sound quality, but not often do we talk about the church or the, the, the cathedral. And not from a, a religious perspective, right? If, if that is, doesn't fit in your community, talk about the history, right? Talk about the, the actual physical space, talk about the buildings, talk about how they were built and kind of the differences in those buildings and how it creates a, a, a new sound, right? But kind of thinking about the community, how we engage with the community, how we go out into the community is also something that will help engage with conversations across these different topics. Um, okay, so just a couple questions to consider. Um, and we just, we just talked about this, but um, what legitimacy, legitimacy signals are you sending during music selection and rehearsing? Um, how might you legitimize various culture or learning styles in your instruction? Are your performances driving for transformation? And then who might be left out when accounting for all strategies? And I'm referring to the strategies here. So thinking about all of these different elements of the classroom, who might be left out when you are having conversations and planning your music and your rehearsals? Okay, so powerful questions. Um, what are powerful questions? Um, they are open-ended questions that create dialogue. Um, if you ask a closed-ended question, especially with a high school student or someone even younger, you probably will get a yes or no answer. Right? So ideally, opening up the question to create a larger explanation will generate conversation with other students. Powerful questions prioritize discovery, right? So a lot of times as educators, we ask leading questions to get students to a particular answer or outcome. A powerful question in a facilitation context kind of prioritizes the, the learning, the experience, and the processing what that students will, will go through. And then also supports the ability to process their experiences, right? So kind of thinking about that trip that you just took, thinking about the piece you just sang, thinking about the score that you received, thinking about the poet that you just talked about, it helps students kind of process through that entire experience. They're useful uh, because they explore your values, beliefs, and motivations, right? So ideally, as educators, our students leave our classrooms not in the day, but at the end of the year or the end of the program with you, a kind of a different person, right? They're going into life with a different perspective, right? So asking these questions and having these conversations will help them explore what they believe, what they value, how, what motivates them. It slows down the impulse of thinking about processing your emotions. And even as an educator, asking yourself powerful questions makes you pause to, to say, okay, is this what I want to do? Is this the best next step? Does this help? Right, and as you see here, explore possibilities before making that decision. Help synthesize learning from experience. Right, um, these last two are my favorite. Powerful questions are useful because they identify previously unrecognized strengths. A lot of, and we're gonna do an activity right before we end today, but it helps you realize, oh, I am good at that thing, or oh, I did enjoy that thing, or oh, I might wanna explore that again, or that was fun, even though we didn't get the score we wanted, I had a, an amazing time because of these particular reasons, all right? And then it also strengthens the student's skill set over time. So ideally, you asking these questions will help students take these questions away. They can ask themselves these questions, right, and then begin to process on their own. A lot of times, um, I as an individual, and even the students that I talked to for my research, were having little small epiphanies with me on, on the phone, like, oh, you're right. My music teacher does do this thing. Or, oh, that was fun, right? And they were processing with me. And as educators, if we do that regularly and sooner, how amazing would they be once they leave our classrooms? 
Hi, it's me again. I'm so sorry to interrupt. After this point in the presentation, Dr. Hyman had a couple handouts for us that provided questions to initiate really great conversations, and it gave us kind of this choose-your-own-ending um, template for how to actually practice the art of facilitation. Again, if you want access to those documents, patreon.com slash music ed matters, but you still get a lot out of this presentation. Listen to how Dr. Hyman wraps this up and really seals the deal as we've learned in this session, how to really become facilitators and engage our singers and our students in new and thoughtful ways. Well, you've given us a huge toolkit of resources now all of a sudden I'm like wow it's choose your own endings every time I open my mouth yeah, <laughs> yeah. um I, I love these reflections these recommendations it's and that's the beauty of facilitation there's no one right answer right it's based on the content based on your your level of expertise with the content is based on your relationship with the students in the classroom. Um, there might be a student that you have a really strong relationship with and you can directly say, we're not going to use that language, right? And they'd be okay with that, right? And there's someone that you might have to kind of, kind of, now let's use this language, right, next time we talk. So, yeah, thank you so much for those reflections. Okay, so as we uh, come to a close, I want to just kind of end by talking about the importance of this, this work, facilitation, but also helping students process through these experiences. Um, one, of the, the, one of my interesting findings in my research is that students of color are aware of race in the school setting. However, they are un, often unsure how to cope with these racialized experiences. All right, here's a quote from one of the young men that I interviewed, and I'll read this for you. It says, also, on a different note, most of the people, but most of the people in my choir room are Asian, and they and the other people are in my academic class are, I don't think there are any black people in my other classes. I think I'm the only black person in every one of my classes. And I asked, well, how do you deal with that? Or kind of how do you navigate the situation? And the student said, just let things slide off my shoulder, I guess. Right. And as the interviewer, I wanted to like have another conversation with him, but I had to continue, <laughs> continue on the interview. Um, but as educators, we have so much power to help our students think through these and process through and understand how to navigate this in school. I wanted you to, to begin to understand that a lot of times we try to find the similarities amongst each other to build relationships, but also remember that our differences serve as advantages for us and really digging into those differences and helping our students uncover the advantages of their differences will help create just a more beautiful space. So that's all I got. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you so cool. much, Dr. Hyman. This was awesome. Of course. Thank you so much. I hope that this will be helpful to kind of integrate some facilitation into your, your teaching. And there are there's a takeaway for you as you move forward. Episode 67 with Dr. Marshawn Hyman, full of information on how we can become the best possible facilitators for everyone in our space, in our choirs, in our classrooms, in our ensembles, whatever it is. I hope you've enjoyed this. You can find out more about Dr. Marshawn Hyman and his awesome organization, True Change Alliance. If you go to emilybirch.org slash sponsors, you can click on the True Change Alliance logo and it will take you directly to their website. Of course, you can catch this entire recording and all the other replays from Teacher PD Weekend at patreon.com slash musicedmatters. But enough housekeeping. Really the important stuff right here. You, you really, really, really matter. If nothing else, that is something huge we learned in this episode. Every single human matters. We all know that music matters. And in this episode, we learned how to use the art of facilitation to highlight new ways that music and people can matter. And I will see you next time on the Music It Matters podcast.